I'm not going to lie, I have competition and my cab is in a sorry state. So, let's fix that. Speakers? Yes, little Durgon friend, speakers. Hello all and welcome back to the corner. Now it's about time that I looked at one of the most iconic parts of the DDR cabinet, but you knew from the intro that that's what we're gonna be looking at. So let's take a quick look at the design. This is a CAD model of one of the speaker box modules. And there's two main parts, the speaker front and the speaker box. The speaker front is just a piece of plastic that supports a three millimeter piece of acrylic, which itself is supporting two metal tubes and the speaker covers. But that's not the interesting bit. The speaker box is, well, firstly a box with a mirror on it, but it's also holding a Dayton Audio ND15 full range driver. Now the speaker specifications and response curve are these, but in layman's terms, it's just a really good speaker for the two and a half inch size. Now the box is undersized, which means it's not gonna be able to reproduce the same low frequencies that the speaker is actually capable of producing. However, it's still gonna sound pretty good for a small size. But my Durgan friend is a little impatient, so let's go on and build these speakers already. Building the speaker boxes was much like building the base cabinet. I cut out the wood panels from 6mm MDF and then I attached some 15x15mm squared dowel to the side panels at the back for support. And after that it gets glued and clamped together. However, despite my meticulous measurements, the box doesn't fit to the cabinet, which strangely has lost its silver colour as well. So, I use the mini disc sander to even the edges out. Now that last clip might have looked a bit tight, and it is. And I've had to chamfer down the corners of the subwoofer box because obviously you've got the glue to worry about. Now this is an example as to why you can spend months and months within a cab software and still end up in this situation where things don't fit because I haven't accounted for the paint that's on these rails. I haven't accounted for the glue that sticks out on the side. These are just things that you have to deal with, but it's fine. We have a sander and it's made this very nice sub box. I'm gonna chamfer this corner down even though I don't really need to. I'm gonna do it on the other one. Now you might be wondering why one of these fits better than the other. And that's quite simple. I didn't build them at the same time. Even though that they should be spaced exactly the same, they're actually not. In fact, they're probably about half mil difference. Also, you budding uh, woodworkers out there might be saying you spaced that without any tolerances and you're correct. This one, for example, has a nice gap right above it, and that's what allows this one to move in much more easily. If I really wanted to, I could do the same on this, but I only need to put the subwoofers in ideally once. So, you know. After that, I measure up the cut for the angled front face on the front of the box. That was nearly a mistake of drawing the lines on the back of the box. This time, I drew it on the front side.
Now, the front of the speakers have a mirror cover on them, and to replicate this, I'm using one millimeter high impact polystyrene sheet with a mirror coating on one side. This just attaches to the front using adhesive, which also allows me to cover the speaker's screws. Now, as for the light ring, I tried many, many ways to replicate this. I tried the obvious LEDs, EL wire, LED filament, looked at LED neon and so on and so forth, but they just didn't cut it. And so I did what any sane person would do. I had some custom CCFL lights made. Now CCFL lights, or cold cathode fluorescent lamps, were the mainstay of custom PCs during the 2000s and were usually the go-to for shaped lighting. However, it's now 2024 and getting CCFL made, especially in pink, is, well, not exactly easy or cheap. And what's worse is that these are the only two rings in existence for this cabinet. Now whilst these rings are somewhat expensive at £30 per piece, replacing them would cost over £2,000. Suffice to say, I've been treating them like a prime nuclear bomb ever since I got them. To hold the rings in place, I'm using these 3D printed TPU parts, and yes, they do look like Lego minifigure hands. You might have remembered in the last episode where PCBWay sent me these lovely boards. Well, now I can show you them being assembled as all the parts have arrived for them. This task took a long time to do, as all of the parts, even though they were mostly surface mount, were very small and required using both a soldering iron and a heat gun. But at the end of it, I now have a lovely and hopefully working amplifier. The volume and tone control PCB is a separate board, it's just attached to the amplifier using these mouse bytes, which it means all I need to do is just cut the mini board off to separate it. And with the amplifier built, I moved on to the stage PCBs, which I'll talk about in an upcoming episode. And then finally I work on the I.O. board, and this took me the longest time to assemble as the QFP64 package was pretty tricky to align. I fit the amplifier to the bracket, which we added in the last episode. And then I attached the I.O. board to the tray, which is also housing my... Hey, hold up a minute! So, the nut seen in the last video was not exactly powerful enough and has since been replaced with this 8th gen NUC, sporting an Intel Core i5-8259U. Sure, it's a little bit older, but it's now more than powerful enough for what I need to do, and when we eventually cover the software, I'll explain why it was underpowered before.
Now to attach the covers to the acrylic piece, I decided to use the same old tried and true method of, well, sticking a threaded insert into the front piece. All I'm doing is getting an M2 thread and then heat staking it into the acrylic so that I can bolt in my two covers. Now I was tempted to make the speaker grills myself, but not having a drill press, that would have been a pain. Okay, there wasn't one here at the time. So instead, I had these pieces laser cut, and then I polished them up. Now these tubes I was going to glue into place. However, when I tried that, it didn't go exactly to plan. First of all, the glue ended up just releasing anyway. It didn't hold very firmly at all. And then when I tried to clean up the glue, I might have found out that isopropyl alcohol apparently cracks acrylic. So yeah, I had to redo that piece. And now the subwoofers are assembled, I think it's time for a quick test. Now, if you're a fan of RMC Retro, then you might have noticed seeing the cabinet in a much more complete and working state. Hello cave dwellers, welcome into the cave. I was contacted recently by a group of YouTubers who asked to book out the cave for a meetup. And I did set one condition for their booking. By the end of the day, I am going to evict you to a desert island and you all have to bring one thing with you that you would take to that desert island. Naturally, I took the cabinet because with enough solar panels and a battery bank, I would easily keep myself entertained on that island. And if I was going to a desert retro island, this is what I would take with me. And this is a quarter scale Dance Dance Revolution or Dancing Stage arcade cabinet that I've been building on my channel. But if you want to hear my other reasons why I took the cabinet, then you should definitely check out the episode, which will be linked in the description below. And if you'd like to go down to one of these meetups, then you should totally check out Retro Collective, which again I will link in the description below. With both subwoofers now built, we can start to look at the marquee. And if we do the same exploded view diagram, the marquee is built up in a few stages. The first stage is the stand, which is a stand. The next stage is the body, and there are two bodies. There is the Betson and there is a curved. 
Now I'm going to do the curved because that's what Euromix 2 uses. And Jacobs, and I, I, it looks nicer. The marquee is mostly made of 3D printed plastic parts, which firstly need to be removed from the rafts and have all their supports removed as well. These parts get some nuts inserted into them and then they get a trim with a razor blade. To make the marquee speaker covers, I ordered some grill cover cloth. After cutting it roughly to the right width, I then use a trick I learned to keep the edges from fraying by running a lit flame across the edge. As the material is made from polyester, a type of plastic, this melts the frayed ends together and prevents it from further fraying and disintegrating. To attach it to the front plastic piece, I'm using a hot knife to plastic weld it down permanently. One inch tweeter is being used to make this part functional, which has a capacitor soldered onto the back side to filter out the bass frequencies, as otherwise it would affect the sound quality. The spot lamps are made by using a 20 by 20 mm PCB to which two wires get soldered onto. I'm using JST PH connectors to terminate the wires as mainly they are relatively small but also an easy to handle connector. And to crimp the terminals on, I'm using an Engineer PA26 crimping tool which has positions designed for exactly four JST PH terminals. The spotlight housing also needs assembling, and to do that I'm gluing the spotlight stand to the main body with epoxy and then letting it cure overnight. Once dried, I screw in the spot lamp PCB and then fit a 286 bulb or otherwise known as a car dashboard light bulb. For the spot lamp colour filter, I'm using some spot lamp colour filters. Cut down of course to the small size, which is then clamped between the body and the spotlight face. Once all of the parts are together, the marquee can be built up. Now, there's a couple of problems. One, I still have not formed the marquee plexi, but more importantly, there's no way attached to the cabinet, so clearly we'll need to drill a few holes. 
With all of that said, I guess the first thing we need to do is travel to my workshop. So, join me. Welcome to my workshop. I can ignore the mess. It's a workshop. Now that we're here though, what we need to do is we need to drill some holes in the top of the monitor section so that we can both mount the marquee and pass wires through to it. And then once we've done with that, we're going to need to enlarge this hole that's in between the monitor section and the base section just to allow for more airflow to get through because during testing I did notice that this would overheat uh, because there's basically no airflow. Um, so yeah, with all that said, let's go with that. Now I know what you're thinking. I thought we did all the modifications last episode so that we could put, go and paint it. And yeah, we did. But the problem is, I didn't know where to drill the holes for the marquee because there's kind of two valid places. And what I mean by that is, this is the hole placements according to the Konami service manual. And what I mean, what I mean by that is if you look at the side profile view, around about here, you can see that the marquee sits quite far back. So I've replicated that here. However, if you look at my own measurements on uh, Dancing Stage Supernova or Dancing Stage Remix 2, the marquee is more in the middle. So both of these are valid locations and I wasn't sure which one to pick. It also doesn't help that when you put the marquee in place, it looks all right there and it also looks all right there. So which one do I go for? Now, according to these measurements by Adam, the original Dancing Stage Euromix marquee is about there. Now, since I'm trying to do that, should I go for that? Well, here's the other problem. This marquee stand, um, well, I don't know what I measured it on because you'd think I'd measured it on the Euromix one, but it doesn't line up with the Euromix one. And so have I made a J-Cab uh, stand instead? Seeing as this is the only one I have, that's kind of why I was hesitating on this. Now, I've been also consulting my absolutely dreadful and atrocious measurements and drawings, but what I can see is that I did measure between the stand and the back, and that was 120-ish centimeters. Now that translates to 32 from the back to the back of this post. Now I also did measure the post and these are 100 mil wide. And if you take a look at this, this measures uh, 25 millimeters. So that means then I did measure from the back of the cab to this post. And if this post is correct, then the correct spacing for this style of cabinet is more central. So in light of that, I'm gonna cut this out stick it on the cabinet and then we're going to mark out the holes. Wow, it would help if I actually cut straight. Now, because I am using these um, T-nuts for wood, uh, I'm gonna have to actually do them the other holes, the mounting holes at four millimeters instead of three millimeters like I was doing for the screws. Right, so we have our holes drilled so hopefully we can remove this and i've not completely destroyed the top paint of this nope it's fine now because i'm a certified genius i'm going to use these t-nuts and the top of this cab however as you'll notice i may have forgot that i put some supports in the way of where i need to put some t-nuts now i could put them on top but well you know i could put them on top but then i'd need really long screws it would save me a lot of time and effort. Oh, I wish I hadn't have done this now. So my plan was gonna to be to use a Dremel to uh, get in there and hack it out, but that seems a lot more effort than just sticking these on, like so. I mean, it'll work, 
It doesn't need to support a lot of weight. It's only holding the marquee on there. So I could do that. I think for the moment I'm going to do this because even though it annoys me in a perfectionist kind of way, it doesn't seem worth it to cut a lot of wood away to just mount those. So yeah, I'm just going to leave them. I'm just going to, I'll put longer screws in. It's fine. You see, the beauty of doing it like this is that if I wanted to change my opinion later on and I do want to fix that, I can. I just have to come back and fix it. But if I don't care, then it's not a problem. Well, they're in. I don't like them, but they are certainly in there. Am I happy with using silver screws on the outside? Meh. All right, the other holes that we need to make are in the base section and the monitor section, and these are just to um, increase the airflow that goes between the two. So my intention is that all the heat will rise up into the monitor section, and I will probably put a fan in the back of the monitor section just to keep it all cool. Um, but in order for proper ventilation to occur, the hole needs to be a lot bigger. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna cut this one out and cut this one out and we'll just roughly cut this hole out. It doesn't have to be perfect. Um, again, it's one of those things where no one's gonna see it. So as long as it's there, that's all that matters. Bloody hell's my hole punch. Have you guys seen a hole punch anywhere? Because I can't. Found it. With the subwoofers and marquee in place, it's now beginning to look like a real deal. And in the next episode, it will begin to work like one too. <laughs>